Hey, Hammer, how's it feel to be the second craziest cop on the force? What was that, Mayjoy? I asked you how it felt to be the second craziest cop on the force. Oh, I thought you said laziest. <laughs> Sorry, my mistake. Would you ever trust a bent cop, Ian? No, I don't think so. Okay. Seems reasonable. <laughs> Why would you? Who would trust a bent cop? I mean, even the people who are bribing them. Yeah. You know. How are you, you scum-sucking, weaselly malcontent? I'm alright, just shaking off a, a winter cold. I'll be fine. How are you, Jerry? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. On to season two of Sledgehammer now. Yes. I've got an apology. Have you? A partial apology. A minute apology. Who to? To Robin Leach. <laughs> to Robin Leach from last week? <laughs> yeah. I think I called him something along the lines of a person of no consequence. <laughs> <laughs> His lawyers um, have been in touch. They have. So <clears throat> I'm not, I have to read this statement. Robin Leach. No, l- last week I mentioned that I was um, not entirely impressed with his CV. Now that was on IMDb. Yeah. My mind was first changed when uh, he was, during the Christmas period, lazily recovering from a, a hangover, eating some chocolate and watching The Bodyguard. Classic. Kevin Costner and Whitney Houston. Do you think Kevin Costner's made any bad films? Mm, yes, That's not true, is made it? quite a lot of yeah. bad films. But anyway, there was a scene where, uh, as his new bodyguard, he tightens up Whitney Houston's security, and another character says, you're going over the score here, even Robin Leach could not get into the, the house or the property. That must have piqued your interest. Said, He's been mentioning Robin Leach and using him as an example of someone who should be allowed to come in. And of course, we mentioned last week the, the TV show, um, Homes, was Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Yeah. Which I'd heard of, but thinking about it now and doing a little bit more research, it appears it was a bigger show. He was more of a... It was important in showbiz gossip circles and fields. Right. He was quite influential, I think. Uh, I think Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous is maybe a precursor to... Cribs or through the keyhole, yeah. A, 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 yeah, a reality show of its of its time. Fair enough. So apologies then to to Robin Leach. Yeah, I think in the day he would have been a bigger name than I gave him credit for. A man of some consequence. Some consequence, not a massive amount of consequence. Well, let's just stop before we get into trouble again. <laughs> anyway, leaving that aside, we have uh, season uh, episode one of season two. We do clockwork hammer. Yes. Thoughts? Initial thoughts? Well, the way that season one was written doesn't really give comfortable grounds for a prequel season, does it? Let's explain what happened at the end of the previous season. Well, I've got that in my summary. Do you want to wait for that? Crack on. Okay. In A Clockwork Hammer, we look back five years to a case that took place long before Sledge failed to prevent the destruction of the entire city in a nuclear explosion. When a loyal police officer fails to give incriminating evidence at trial, Sledge is thrust into the investigation after a confrontation at his apartment. Villains attempt to break Sledge down using futuristic mind control techniques, but in the end, the trial hinges on their effectiveness. Will Sledge lose his mind, or is it far too late for that? Thanks, Ian. Somebody like clockwork as usual. I clawed that one out from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so before we move on, Five years. Five years. <laughs> it makes no sense because Hammer and Duro are clearly introduced in the pilot episode. Yeah. They don't know each other. No. They've not been working in cases together for a long time. Do you think that the Slash Hammer show needs to make sense? Well, this is what I'm going to say. It's probably just not worth worrying about. Not a lot of people, I don't think, who are going to be saying that's against canon. I think it's actually a deliberately... Um, ridiculous plot storyline. I think they're, they're showing it's just how silly it is. I mean, you've had Dallas with dreams and all this type of stuff previously. Yeah. I think they've just went, yep, it's in the past and move on. Let's not labour the point. Give Dory a different hairstyle. Let's go on. Well, I was going to say that, yes. she a new 80s haircut, hasn't it's, she? It's now set as something like 1981, 1982. Mm. So, when I was, I'd just been born. Mm-hmm. And this is what was going on in the world. Apparently. So presumably the cultural references will also be 1981, 1982 and not 1988. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we begin? We begin at the court. Yep, in the courtroom. And we see a reporter, Amy Porter. Yes. 
She is reporting live from a case that has a detective raker testifying against Johnny Red Shoes Haggis, who is charged with killing a DA. Presumably a Scottish villain. Mm -hmm. Have you still got your pet Haggis? I had to, um, sadly. Oh. Let him go, I'm okay. afraid. Oh, okay, we won't say any more about yeah. that then. Okay, so this testimony is disrupted and is ultimately unsuccessful due to some sort of breakdown and problem with Raker's memory. Yeah, some kind of an episode on the stand. He starts visualising explosions and crying out and then he attacks the DA effectively. Yeah, he goes manic and he's dragged from the courtroom in a rage whilst the accused smirks. Yeah, and he's allowed to sit with his feet up on the, the table. Showing off his red shoes, his red boots, I think. Yes, but not his haggis. No, that's uh, kept well hidden. Yes. A true Scots, a true Scotsman never shows his haggis. Never. Never. That's a well-known phrase. <laughs> in fact, I think that's in Macbeth. That's where it comes from. That's it. Mm -hmm. A wee timorous quid, what is it? A wee curing timorous species. Yep, that's what it's referring to. Yes. Chaps yeah. haggis. That wasn't, that was Burns. Yeah, all the same, isn't it, really? <laughs> uh, it was a bit of mouse. No, it was a bit of haggy scene. Not that one. Okay. Did it have an ode to a mouse? To a mouse? Yeah. Yeah, but there was two haggis was a completely separate one. He wasn't green or dimmer. You, you address the haggis, don't you? Yeah, address to the haggis. Fair for your honest sonsy face. Great <laughs> chieftain of the pardon race. We're in the precinct. Sledge is disgusted at the cancellation of the policeman's field day. Yes, he was looking forward to one of the events, wasn't he? Yes, it was his turn to be shot out of the cannon. It was, yes, he <laughs> likes shooting and things like that. I liked, um, did you spot this? When he comes in, he puts the end of the nuclear bomb from last week on his table. <laughs> ah, I didn't spot that, no. <laughs> well, I thought it clearly looked like the exact same prop. Uh -huh. It was the nose of the nuclear bomb. He sits there on his table and says, very, I'm not needing that anymore. Very good, very good. <laughs> Dory mentions the... Raker incident and Sledge goes from thinking he was a, a decent guy to a worthless scumbag. Talking about Shakespeare that we were a minute ago, did you like um, Sledge's eloquence at this point? Remind me. He says, how sharper than a serpent's tooth is an ungrateful punk. <laughs> is that uh, a play on any particular line? Or I'm guessing that's something from Shakespeare, the serpent's tooth thing, but mm. I didn't look up the quote, I'm afraid. Someone will fill us in, I'm sure. I'm sure. Sledge is concerned about Trunk. Yeah, he knows that Raker was a favourite of Trunks. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently he was like a, what, did they say a second-hand father? Something on those things. <laughs> so they get through to Trunks' office to attempt to console him or cheer him up. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting, Captain. Just wanted to cheer you up, sir. That's impossible. This is the worst day of my life. Now you see right there you're wrong. You've said many times that the worst day of your life was the day I joined the force. Now you feel better? Yes. Captain, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation for Chris Raker's sudden breakdown. Oh, it's obvious what happened. He was pretending. Johnny Red Shoes Haggis paid him off. I hear you can make a lot of money in acting. Raker would never sell out. He had integrity, you understand? And the mere fact that you would even suggest that he was... Go ahead. Let it out. You'll feel better, Captain. Never! You know, Captain, I thought he sounded real. All that ranting about violence. Well, that's difficult to fake. No, believe me, Raker is a faker. All cops face violence. The ones who can't deal with it crack. The ones who can, teach. Yeah, but just talk to him. You want to talk to him? Why don't you dial him direct? 555 Weasel. Trunk's not going to let that phone call go ahead. He puts his hand on the receiver. <laughs> And then has it crushed by Sledge replacing the handset. They head over to the front desk and Mayjoy asks Sledge how it feels to be the second craziest cop in the force as we heard at the top of the podcast. Yeah. Sledge uh, takes some offence because he thought it was uh, lazy, as he said. Doesn't mind being regarded as crazy. Second craziest is fine. Second laziest, no. No, no, no. He has concerns about Raker, which he expresses to Dory. He didn't like his perfect attendance record. Yes, he says that um, even a perfect cop will have days off because he'll be taking a bullet or two, something along, along those lines, I think. Yeah, he doesn't think that Raker is as clean cut as he's made out to be. No. Um, he's showing off his gun to Dory as well, which causes a bit of a, a ruckus as folk come off a lift. <laughs> yes, it's ledges. Yeah, waving it around above his head. I like that. And we head over to 
VVC. Vile Video Concept. Yeah, the headquarters. It's got a very ominous feel to it already, hasn't it? Yeah, the first line that I enjoyed was, you tell me, what's wrong with an alien puppet living with a suburban family? Now, you have to, you're aware of the reference there? Yeah, I watched Alf. Did you? The person behind Alf just died recently. Did he? The when you see the person it. behind him, the guy with well, his hat, his hand up the... I'm not sure if it's the actor who played Alf or if it's the producer of the show. Someone, one of the Alf people died mm -hmm. recently. Yeah. Um, and it was highlighted that Alf was one of the major things he was involved in. Sure. I presume it started around that time. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, Alf was massive. I remember as, as a kid, it was huge. Oh, it was, over here, it was massive. So it was like Saturday tea time. Channel 3 sort of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've not watched it for a while, I might uh, try and dig out a few episodes on YouTube. Not probably sure one, no, probably not. Yeah, it's a bit like Harry and the Hendersons, isn't it? Yeah, Bigfoot and Hendersons, as it was called here. Yes. In any case, the founder of a VVC, a chap called Smartikov, speaks with another man. Now, I think this other guy is, is he the lawyer? I'm not sure if he's a lawyer or he's just like a hired hand, but he certainly is involved in the defence team mm. for Haggis. And we find out that Smartikov had set up uh, VVC after being released by a network for being too high concept and that's... It's a crazy idea essentially. Yeah. He then shows off his mind control technology that works via television and says that he could even start the fourth network. <laughs> much to the amusement of the other, other chap. Yeah, so they, they refer to a fourth network that already exists that doesn't count as a network. So yeah. I don't know what one that is that referring to. Right. We can discuss this in the trivia. Okay. Um, he then goes on a, a rant about the coalescence of man and TV to form a super race of human television crossbreeds. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how realistic that is. I think he's thinking of the Teletubbies, maybe? Perhaps. But before that, we find out that the this other chap is a, a representative of Haggis and he had handed over, or he hands over, 500,000 as payment for the successful negation of Raker's testimony. That's right. And as you mentioned, he goes on this rant about, yes, the. I think he says that um, the world will be controlled by the people watching, the man who watches television who quickly cut to Sledge in front of his, on his couch. couch. Now, I heard um, a bit of audio from what he was watching. I think it was the Cosby show. Right. Can't watch that anymore. You can't watch that anymore, no. No. Yeah, I've often wondered when things like this happen, you know, one person, whether it's part of a, a band, a TV show, who gets involved in this sort of thing and the the product is pulled, everyone else must be really unhappy if they've got royalties or residuals. You yeah. know, perhaps they're living off that. All those guys that played with Gary Glitter. You could have probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, his band members. Yeah, I'm sure his bass players are very unhappy. Anyway, where were we? Sledge is so watching TV and there's a, a chap at the door. There is a chap. His name is Raker. <laughs> He's there. He appears. Uh, but Sledge initially is not interested in listening to his explanations. Look, if you came here for insults, I already gave at the office. Hammer, I have to talk to somebody. Yeah, well, don't confess. Let me beat it out of you. I hate cops who take bribes. I didn't take a bribe. Now listen, you're the only one I can talk to. You're bloodthirsty, but you're trustworthy. Now you gotta listen to me. I don't listen to malcontents. Especially malcontents who malcontent all over the captain. Hammer, listen, listen, I'm telling you the truth. I don't know what happened to me on the stand. There was the sound, this noise. I couldn't remember anything. And then these nightmares. These terrible, weird nightmares. They seem so real. Oh, the one where you haven't been to class all semester and it's the day of the final and you're in your underwear? No, these revolve around a white room. You gotta help me. I just helped you quit smoking. All right, look, I don't know what happened to you on the stand. Maybe you didn't take a bribe. Maybe you just cracked under the pressure. But you better remember what happened with Johnny Red Shoes Haggis, or that slime ball's gonna ooze free. So Sledge tries an interesting technique of his own to try and get Raker to remember. What happened with Haggis? What does he do? He says, remember, remember, remember. <laughs> uh, but it causes Raker to hear the noise again and he freaks out and he wants Hammer to hit him because he can't hit himself hard enough. Sledge happily obliges. Yeah, he, say, he says you can come over here anytime. <laughs> As they break up the apartment. Yeah, completely Just... wreck it. <laughs> I think he says something along the lines of I love it when company drops by. <laughs> so. 
How does he finally knock out the raker? Is he hitting with like the coat stand or something along those no, lines? No, it's or? like a cartoon. He takes two fr- uh, two yes, saucepan lids. So, yes. Smashes yes. it each side of his head. Because Raker's getting the better of him up to a point. Mm-hmm. It's a little later in the evening and we see Raker being carried out by uh, paramedics. Yeah, and Dory's there. She is. And he admits that he saw something in Raker's eyes. Like he'd just stepped over the edge and he'd seen this before. When had he seen it before? Well, Dory suggests in the war and Sledge says, no, it was in the mirror. They have a chat about what triggered Raker and Hammer recalls the White Room and that maybe gives Dory a bit of a pointer. So we head back over to the precinct and using the computer, they find an article from the Reader's Digest that discussed the KGB's use of the White Room technique. Yeah, they couldn't really Google it, could they? No. Dory is sceptical at first. She doesn't believe that networks would use TV to brainwash viewers and what well, your favourite shows gets a little bit of a, a mention here, doesn't yeah, it? what did Sledge say? He says, have you ever seen Matlock? <laughs> oh, come on, Sledge. <laughs> <laughs> I love Matlock. <laughs> I've never watched Matlock. That's yeah, brilliant. They then both come to the same conclusion. Yes, they do. What's that? Well, they understand that the mob had used this white room technique on Raker to disrupt his witness statement. Yeah, and Hammer's got a plan. He needs to take it to Trunk. So, we go to Trunk's office. Sledge wants Trunk to start a rumour that he has new evidence against Haggis and will testify the next day. Yes. Trunk himself is sceptical that this rumour will work, but why is Sledge confident? I can't remember. What does he say? He says, don't worry, it'll be fine. We will get a woman to start it. (laughs) That's not funny. Yeah, that's my favourite line. Okay. (laughs) Trunk then himself understands Sledge's plan and tells him to put the network in the dumper. And what does, how does Sledge respond? I can't I miss that. What was that? He pu- he quizzically says, I thought I did last year. I do like, I know, I'm surprised I missed that because I do like the, the little references. Where do we head off to next? Hammer's apartment. Dory is anxious to stay with him. She wants to hide in his closet. She does, yeah. This is because they both see uh, the reporter, Porter, deliver the rumour on the news. They do. And they think the bad guys are going to come. For Hammer, essentially. Yeah. Uh, Dory does seem a little bit needy here. It's obviously a, a different characterisation to what we saw in the previous season. You see, needy or just that she's even more now concerned about her friend Sledge's welfare? No, because we even see a couple of times in this episode she seems romantically interested in Hammer. So I'm assuming this is something that gets knocked out of her. I'm not sure, again, if I would say that... Dory wants Hammer to be romantically interested in her, but I think that any sort of compliment from him, whether it's just a, a friendly compliment or, or or whatever, is something that she's yeah maybe she 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 needs that. And you say needy, that's maybe slightly unfair. If you're working with Hammer, who shows you know, or, or is meant to show little or no emotion towards you, and you're working, you're putting your uh, your life in the line with this person day in day out in these cases. I think, you know, you do need some sort of attachment. You do need some sort of bond there. So do you see the relationship here as carrying on from what we saw last in the first season? Yeah, I think it's developed slightly. But I don't, yeah, I don't see it's too much of a, a disparity or too much of a, uh, yeah, a difference. You're not seeing this as an earlier version of their relationship then? No, no. I think yeah. we forget the whole thing about being four or five years in the past. I... Totally ignore. Right. Okay. I don't buy into that. I don't bother with that at all. Okay. Uh, but as you said a moment ago, uh, Dory is suggesting that she stays with Hammer. Yes. Sledge, however, has all the backup he needs and is less than receptive. Look, the mob has probably been watching this apartment all evening and they're not going to make a move till you leave. So, beat it. I can take care of myself. Always have. Always will. You know, it's okay to let people care about you. It's it's not a slight against your masculinity. It's human. Zoro, I think I hear your mother calling. You know, beneath that loner exterior and twisted mind lurks a heart. A heart with real emotion. It's really okay to let it out every once in a while. One more insult like that and you're going out of here on a stretcher like Raker. You win. 
You know, <laughs> once I'd like to come over here when it wasn't a crisis. <laughs> I mean, you could just invite me over here and we could just talk. Is that too much to ask? I don't know. Depends. Just call before you come over. Why? Think you might make me dinner? No, I want to disarm all the booby traps. Dory seems disappointed at that response, but I think that's quite romantic from as far as Sledge goes. As far as Sledge goes, yes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I like that that little scene. You said needy. I think just human. Hmm. I just feel that like she seems a bit less independent than she did in the previous episodes. She's becoming more attached to him, yeah. She is less independent. She's working with a partner and she... Yeah, but this is five years earlier when she It's had not five years earlier. <laughs> But we don't even know, I mean, if, if, let's for a second talk about that. If this was five years prior to the explosion, but we don't know how many years when it was when they first met. I mean, we don't know how many... How long years. season one was. Yes. So season one could have taken place over a period of ten years, potentially. Or maybe like it was one year up until the last episode, which is five years in the future, or yeah. ten years in the future. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a... F you know, it doesn't necessarily need to go back to prior to them meeting. Okay. Are we just going to then treat the rest of the season like it happens yeah. after season one? Yes. I suggest that's what we do. Okay, that's thrown me a little bit for this episode, but okay. Okay. I'll try and get with it going <laughs> forwards. She does leave, ultimately. She does. And later we see Sledge in bed with Gunny. When he hears a couple of guys break in wearing VVC jumpsuits. <laughs> They've got a, a chloroform spray <laughs> they use on Sledge. Very uh, cartoon, isn't it? Wily Coyote yes. type stuff, isn't it? They abduct him and then he's in a white room. Yes, at the VCC headquarters. A VVC. The VVC headquarters. <laughs> so yeah, he's tied down uh, to this chair, clockwork orange style, and is being shown different images in order for him to forget all about Haggis. Yeah, you say clockwork orange, it always makes me think of Glasgow. Huh? Well, that's what they call the subway. All right, okay. Yeah. yeah, people have not been to Glasgow. Sorry, I thought you meant being <laughs> been tied down, tied down in <laughs> a chair and abused. It's a, a circular uh, subway route and the trains are orange and it gets called the Clockwork Orange yeah, for those right. who doesn't know. So they are attempting to reprogram Sledge, but he just falls asleep. Well, yeah, he's variously either not affected or sleeping. And at level four, they're going to, and they turn up to signs of extreme violence to reinforce their message. But Sledge loves what he sees, frustrating these two guys. <laughs> so Smartikov just wants to shoot. I mean, this is the type of thing that um, uh, Mike Myers would have suggested in Austin Powers. He said, right. why don't we just shoot him? <laughs> We've got him here. <laughs> oh, this, this is quite a palaver. Why don't we just shoot the guy? Uh, I think someone asks Smartikov if he's mad at some point, And he says, of course I'm mad. Would a sane man work in television? Yeah. So they resolve to get to him via his subconscious. Yes, they, they use that to program him to kill the DA when he is on the stand. Yeah, so they create a, a Max Headroom style character of Sledge himself. And this appears to work. Yes. Sledge will forget all about Tagus and in fact, if he is pressed too far, will kill the DA. That's it. Hammer then wakes up in his own apartment, feeling like he's had a good sleep. Yes, very refreshed and he heads off to the courthouse. He does, and he takes the stand and things get a little bit more dramatic. I don't remember. I mean, why else would you tell Captain Trunk that you had new, important information? No, I... <clears throat> I... No! I mean, no. no. This is no time for fooling around, Inspector. What about Haggis? I, I don't remember. Nothing? I don't remember. Thank Shut up! I said I don't remember! Nothing? I don't remember! <laughs> Stop! <laughs> Stop! <laughs> I can't take it! My head! It's a noise! Get me here! Stop! Do oh, you goofball cock? You're supposed to shoot the DA, not me! Bail and Foresti still. They've already killed the dead DA, then they brainwashed Raker and tried to brainwash me. How's that for a quick explanation? Guns are drawn at that point, and Hammer quickly shoots the lawyer slash team member who was at the VVC place. Yeah, before he does him. that, there's a stray bullet which takes the toe off Red Shoes, he's a Red Shoe. No, that's what causes it. I think Hammer oh. shoots this other guy and his gun goes off and shoots oh. Haggis in the foot. Yes, you're right. 
Um, and, and Hammer points out that they forgot one thing. Yes, they were trying to get to him through his subconscious. He doesn't have a subconscious. <laughs> it's all on one level. <laughs> and we head back to Trunk's office for this week's epilogue. Yes, Hammer is explaining that he kept avoiding the brain, or he could avoid the brainwashing by thinking about someone that he'd not given enough attention to recently. Yeah, some, someone who uh, he's neglected, someone beautiful and sleek and attractive, etc. And we see uh, Dory being quite coyish at this point, believing... Coquettish, almost. Yeah, that the um, compliments were directed at her. But no, um, he explains that someone he hasn't been able to express his true feelings for, his gun. Yeah. Now, you have said in the past that you liked the sparing use of his relationship with his gun yeah, it this wasn't was overused. Really on a bit heavy, wasn't it? It was a bit heavy, I must admit. Um, Twice in this episode. Yes. So I'd have preferred that to be reined in slightly, because the first season definitely was not. It was great, and he was ashamed of the fact that anyone heard him speak to his gun. But now it's like out in the open. Yeah. This so, is my pal. This is my trope. Yeah. I'm going to hammer this until it's dead. We'll see how that develops and progresses. Maybe it is reined back. Fingers crossed. But overall, thoughts then? It had high points. Again, like with the last few, the, the second time you watch an episode, it's better than it seemed the first time. I think there's there's things that you need to you know, give it a bit of a chance to, to work. Yeah, I agree. When I first watched this for the podcast, I hadn't seen it in a number of years, this episode, and I thought to myself, mm, yeah, watched it again for note-taking purposes, and yeah, it certainly had grown on me. There was... There were subtleties and there was nuances. Uh, so, yes, I, I enjoyed it overall. It's not certainly in the upper echelons of the, the the best episodes of season one, but it's uh, it's not a stinker. It's fine. It's fine, yeah. <laughs> we'll say that. They can put it on the DVD cover. It's not a stinker. It's fine. Slash Hammer Sledge Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't one of the strongest ones, but uh, it's still perfectly acceptable. It had its moments, but the whole five year thing I think if that hadn't been on at the start hmm. if they just made up something about them surviving the explosion or it didn't go off really it was just imagining then maybe it would be easier to take some of this see I think it was a deliberate you know deliberate flipping, stupid. Yeah, yeah. Saying it. We, so we don't care we don't we put them up and we're just going to carry on I think that's exactly it. that's what I was trying to say earlier I think they, they're, they're deliberately not trying to have a convoluted explanation they just went oh yeah this was in the past let's move on and let's do this again it's like they're saying, if that's important to you, this isn't your show. I think so, yeah. yeah that's probably fair enough. Definitely. Okay, what do you want to do now? Should we do favourite line and then go into the trivia? Sure. What was your favourite line? Uh, I mentioned it earlier, it was the one about uh, the, the Sledge's plan will work because the rumour will be started by a woman. Mine was the how sharper than a serpent's tooth. I like that. Production information. The 17th of September 1987 was the original air date and directed again by Reze Badai. This is his second of three. And again, uh, written by Chris Ruppenthal, second of four. Alan Spencer also had a story credit this week. Okay. So some of the guest stars. Nicholas Guest, appropriately, played uh, Smartikov. He was born in 1951. These days he's mainly a voice actor. He's appeared in Frozen, Paranorman, Batman the Bold and the Brave, uh, Sons of Anarchy, a lot of Star Trek video games, USA High. He's been in Midnight Caller uh, and Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. That was well received and well respected, mm -hmm. I think. I think he played a cadet, minor role. He is the half-brother of Anthony Hayden Guest, who was satirised in The Bonfire of the Vanities. And you might not know this, Ian, but I'd seen him before. He played the dad in the Aerosmith video, uh, Jenny's Got a Gun. You must have recognised Dan Loria, who played Raker, Detective Raker. Yes, that... Face, but I don't know where from. Oh, come on. What should I know him from? Born in 1947, he has been in Pitch, Stakeout, Costello, Party of Five, Independence Day. He's been in Cagney and Lacey, Moonlighting, but he is most famous for playing Jack Arnold in The Wonder Years. Ah, I've never seen that. You've not? What? You've seen Alf, but not The Wonder Years. Yeah. Same time. I'll have seen him from Independence Day, I'd imagine. Dorothy Dells played the judge. This is her third of three including Under the Gun and Brother Can You Spare a Crime. Beverly Leach played reporter Amy Porter, 
Born in 1959, she has been in Six Feet Under, Star Trek Away Team, which is a video game apparently. Yeah. Evening Shade, Mad Men, Arliss, Star Trek Voyager, Square One Television, MathNet, and we have discussed her or seen her before when she played Dee Dee Ross in Columbo Butterflies and Shades of Grey. Oh, with Bill Shatner. Yes, she was, if you remember, uh, at a restaurant, there was um, an up-and-coming actress who apparently had gotten pregnant by a senator. Yes, and there was, a, there was rumours and stuff like that. That right? he was, yeah. Okay, some trivia, some obvious ones. The title was a play in A Clockwork Orange, an Anthony Burgess novel and a Stanley Kubrick film. The original title for this episode was going to be Max Sledgeroom. Now, I don't know if you know much about it, but Headroom was a character set in a near future which was dominated by TV and large corporations. That makes sense. Eh? It does. I'd never watched the show. I don't think it was very big over here. Are you going to get letters now if it was popular? Yeah. Remember that, the very first ever Columbo podcast? And we yeah. said the Partridge family wasn't huge yeah. <laughs> in the UK. We're still getting comments yeah. about that. Oh, it was massive back in the 70s. Uh, but no, I know. I really only know about Max Headroom because of the similar character in Back to the Future 2. Right. You know, in the uh, cafe 80s. Okay, rings a bell. We briefly mentioned earlier on. So the fourth network referred to Fox, which was an up-and-coming news station okay. after ABC, NBC and CBC, CBS. Okay. So they thought this uh, fourth network, there was no room for it, it would never last, etc, etc, but if a joke station. Home of the Simpsons has been going for quite some time. Mm, certainly has. I don't know much about the history of Fox, but I would suggest that that's a very large part uh, of the, the, the success. <clears throat> What's their slogan? Don't know. Don't watch They've it. They've got a slogan about it being completely neutral. Can't really? Have they? Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. The motto of Fox News is fair and balanced. <laughs> it's about as fair as balanced as the Daily Mail is in this country. Yeah. It? Well, Fox has just acquired Sky. Mm -hmm. It has. So, There's always a relationship there. Anyway, yeah. Being a Murdoch. Mm -hmm. The world's connected. I think it's maybe one of those ones where one arm of a company group sells to another to move some money around, but yeah. I don't know about the ins and outs, so that's... Anyway, <sighs> Smartikov was um, a play on Brandon Tartikov, who was an NBC executive in the early 80s who turned around the station, a bit of a whiz kid. Next week we have Big Nazi on campus. How many of those at our school, what were you? Three. Oh. <laughs> anyway, that's us, we're... A fairly long episode this week. We'll just very quickly say to folk that we're still on social media, Twitter and Facebook, we're at Sledgecast and there will be a post, I know the show notes have been slow recently, but join us at sledgehammerpodcast.com where you can chat about the episode in the meantime. And we shall see you next week. Cheerio. Porridge. <laughs>